Hello, everybody. I'm so excited. We're here for part two of our Planet Talks with my friend Cindy. And we're going to be talking about one planet that I'm slightly obsessed with right now because I've just recently learned that they don't have thumbs on this planet and all they do all day is just do it. So I'm really fascinated by this. And this is the planet of Venus. And we're also going to be talking about the planet of Jupiter. Now, if you missed our part one discussion, we spoke about last week about the sun and about Saturn. And I will place part one down in the description box below. It's not necessary to watch part one first, but it is down there just in case you want a refresher on those two planets or you happen to miss them of course along with that will be all the links to cindy's youtube channel as well as the website to her magic school her yoga shala where she runs all these awesome courses where you can get deeper into your personal interpersonal relationship with all these energies that are around us including the planets how are you today cindy I'm good. Thank you. I'm happy and excited to be here to talk about two of, uh, I love both Jupiter and Venus. I mean, they're just full on benefic, you know, there's, it's, they're, they're all good. Mm -hmm. And I, you've been slight, you know, okay, so I've been slightly obsessed with both of them, honestly, Jupiter, I've been working with Jupiter for many years, but then at my home in my bedroom, I actually have a, a whole little altar set up just for Aphrodite. And Aphrodite is Venus, in essence, yeah. Aphrodite is just the Greek interpretation of Venus. And I've been lighting that, that little altar up for probably a good year. Ooh. And uh, so Venus is just so Venus, Aphrodite, you know, all about harmony and pleasure and love, <laughs> all the different forms of love. I mean, we could all use some of that. I know. I so funny. Anytime. Cindy, uh -huh. as, as yoga teachers, we're always like, accept the suffering. Pain is real. Like, but when we get to talk about like Venus, it's kind of fun because that's also a part of being human is experiencing the good sensations as well. And it just one of, so I know, I know people watching know that Elton John is dirty, but I do like his music. And I just keep getting that whenever I think about Venus, that song Levi, where he's like in Jesus, he wants to go to Venus leave leave on far behind i kind of want to go to venus too because it does sound like they are having some fun over on venus as i said we have heard they don't have thumbs and we've talked about sydney that the um the creation of the thumb is what created such polarization on our planet because it created weapons and all kinds of stuff but mm -hmm. apparently over on venus as i've jokingly said but seriously what i've heard is they literally just like do it all day you know like i can stick it I could see that. <laughs> so Aphrodite, what's that line from Thoroughly Modern Millie? Aphrodite, don't forget me, Romeo and Juliet me. Like, so, so let's talk, no. let's start with Venus. Let's start with some fun, some fun Venus information. And we, and Venus just went direct again, right? It was also retrograde. So can, we all, everybody knows about Mercury retrograde. Like your communication gets a little bit off. There's positive and negative. So when Venus goes retrograde, what does that mean for like relationships and stuff like that? Since that's kind of the, the house, it kind of rules or the, the pleasure sensation with, within ourselves and with other people as well. Mm -hmm. Well, then Venus retrograde talking about love or, um, you know, songs that would be, where is the love? <laughs> Venus goes into retrograde, you know? Because <laughs> that's what it feels like. Where did you go? Where's the yeah. love? And you'll feel that in the um, in your relationships as well. There might be a slight breakdown in communications or, or some of the aspects or challenges that you've had in your relationships will start to come up during during her retrogradation. And, and even toward yourself, because... Uh, uh, in, in Greek, you know, there, there are different kinds of love. There's the relationship, the romantic love. There is the love that you have between friendships. There's uh, the love that you have, just the collective love over humanity. And, you know, the love that you have toward yourself. And so it affects all of that. So it's, it's gonna affect not just your relationships, but the relationship that you even have with, with yourself. It, it can bring up any issues that you have where you're still beating yourself up about something or you have shame, or you have guilt toward yourself. Um, you know, so the, her, when she goes into a retrograde, it brings up anywhere where, where the love is, is missing or it's gone or, 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 or it's been kind of misplaced or, or um, anything like that. 
Well, it's kind of, it, it can though, even though that sounds like awful, like everyone dreads that, but it, it's a, it's a good time to like reevaluate things and work on things, especially if, if it's with a partner that you do love, you can, when those issues come up, you can start to actually use it as a time to kind of see where the work lies within that relationship too. So it's not always a bad thing. I do know, however, that just like in Mercury retrograde, it's not a good idea to like start a new project in Mercury retrograde. It's a good time to end a project, but it's not a good time to start a new project. Well, Venus retrograde, that's not a good time to start like a new relationship. Is it like a love relationship? You want, you want it to start when Venus is direct. I would say so. Yeah. I mean, but I, I, unless you just want to start off with just some immediate, like, if you're strong enough, you know, like mature enough to go in with some immediate, like, Hey, you know, look at me because, well, uh, Venus is, it, she rules harmony mm -hmm. and it, she rules harmony in relationships. So if you, if you're going into a relationship with, when that aspect is in like a shadow or a retrograde period, then it can make it certainly more, um, more challenging. We don't yeah. have a challenge when it comes to relationships. <laughs> exactly. So, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> so, uh, a challenge already. So, um, and she just went direct again, right? So, we were in this period of, of, of time where Venus was also retrograde with Mercury, and now she just went direct again. And so, um, and it's interesting because once you start, at least I noticed, once you start to understand the planetary influences and energies around you, you can actually feel it when the energy shifts in your own life. I mean, I can at least. You can kind of feel when that that it's not as staticky anymore as as it maybe mm -hmm. once what, what, what it was for a couple of weeks, you know. So because she's not in right. How long does she go retrograde? When I mean, it retrograde? was just. I'm not exactly sure the date, but it was just a few days ago, maybe yeah. a week ago. Yeah, it wasn't terribly long ago, and you know, retrogrades have a shadow period mm -hmm. too. They sure do. And so it takes a minute for it to for the direct where you feel like it, it really kicks back in again. I can just so, hear people yeah. at home now going, Oh my God, this explains so much. <laughs> exactly. Right. It does. You're like, Oh my God, I'm not crazy. It's because I saw the funniest thing on Facebook. I think it was like a tweet and I screenshotted it. And this guy was like, I need some white girl with a nose ring, which is me to tell me which planet is making me depressed. And someone put underneath it. It's earth, bro. It's earth. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it's her. I just thought it was so funny. What plan is making me depressed right now? <laughs> so, um, well, what, so Aphrodite, will you tell, uh, for people who aren't familiar with Aphrodite, I know people, a lot of people know that name. Um, can you kind of give a little backstory on who Aphrodite is since she is Venus? Yeah, she's the, the Greek version of Venus, Aphrodite, the goddess of love. And it's all the, it, she has a lot of the same attributes that, that Venus does. You know, she uh, represents um, like the harmony, um, the the pleasure. And, and that's where we really, I think, you know, when we think of Aphrodite, we think of the, the pleasure aspect. Of course, the love aspect, but especially the pleasure side of life. Cause, I mean, if you think of aphrodisiacs, yeah, it's named true. after Aphrodite. And it's learning how to really, and that's how I feel like, um, since I've had the Aphrodite altar set up for a while, that has been one of the biggest lessons uh, that she's had for me is this idea of pleasure. And I think I shared this in another video that I made with another friend of mine when we were talking about Venus, but our capacity to receive very much lies in our capacity to experience more pleasure in our lives. Like the frequency of pleasure, it's like when you're, you're in that place of pleasure, and I'm not just talking about sexuality, of course, yeah. you know, yeah. a, good, a good orgasm is always good, but I'm just talking about in general, like, yeah. in general pleasure, seeing the, the beauty and enjoying the sensations like Aphrodite and Venus are associated with uh, um, enjoying the sensations of life enjoying the food that you taste, enjoying the, um, you know, what, like when you're, you, you, you look out into nature, like really truly seeing the beauty, taking in the smells and your sensations fully coming alive and the pleasure that you receive from 
from that because that is that is what life is you know life is more about experiencing than it is anything else and that's what aphrodite and venus are about and when we close off our pleasure which that resides within our second energy center which is also very much uh, there's some stigma around that too where oh you know we shouldn't flex pleasure is bad yeah. You know, if, if you go to some older dogmatic beliefs where, you know, pleasure, it can be distracting or, or it's bad or you shouldn't go down the line of pleasure, down the line or, or down that lane of, of desire. Mm -hmm. And sure, I mean, it can get to a point where it, it becomes addictive right. or it can, be, it, it can become a distraction for sure. Uh, but if you close it off completely and just say, well, pleasure is bad, like, you know, enjoying um enjoying all my sensations and even you have to watch that even a little bit with the um how we interpret things like the yoga sutras because the the, the yoga sutras you got the, the prachahara which is a withdrawal of the senses right and i yeah. think there's there's a reason for that so that you can that you can come back and not not be so distracted yeah so there, there's a balance with this you know there's a balance Absolutely. at play with enjoying life enjoying it and not being afraid of pleasure but at the same time not letting it distract you from work from your purpose or your yeah. mission or your work or it not turning into some kind of an addiction or an attachment mm -hmm. so there is like a, a carefulness that that needs to go with that but you know i don't think that it means that we close our life off from pleasure altogether no absolutely when we do that it also closes off your capacity to receive because again that frequency of pleasure it feels good right there's there's just something about it that makes you just really truly come alive yep. and that's what aphrodite and venus is like oh you you just start to to open your eyes and and you become a numb mm -hmm. like if you numb yourself i mean there's a certain I mean, that doesn't feel very good. I mean, it might to a certain, you know, degree for someone who doesn't want to feel anything. But Aphrodite is saying, no, you know, it's time to feel again. It's time to enjoy your senses because feeling is part of the whole sensational realm as well. It's funny. If you close yourself all, to, you close your senses, you close your feelings, you know, you close your, you know, your sensations you close yourself off to, to life itself, to the life force. Right. And when you do that, you also close yourself off from the abundance, from receiving. Yeah. You know, a lot of times we, we, we close off because we don't want to receive the negative, like the bad things, like the yucky smells or something we look at. We don't like, we don't like what we see. So we, we turn our heads or, or we, we close our ears because we don't want to hear what's, what's coming or we don't want to hear what's being said. And then that just creates like this place of, um, of, of what's the word of denial. Yeah. And, you know, and Aphrodite is like the opposite of that. It's the opposite of, of living in denial. It, she's like, take it in, you know, take it in fully. Yes. Do your practices to keep you on track. Do your practices to, um, to keep you from, you know, going into the realms of, of um of like suffering yeah you know what i mean because when we open ourselves to feelings we open up to sensations we open up to all of it yes you know what i mean yeah and that's what she asks you to do it's like you don't just close yourself you can't it's really hard to close yourself to some of it you know when you close yourself off, you close yourself off to the good and the bad right it's really hard to close yourself off to just the bad that's almost impossible so the second you you shut down, you shut down the good and the bad, which then shuts down your ability to also like really take in and to receive. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. And it's funny too talking about because I always, you know, in uh, my soul, well, even at in a lead primary class in Ashtang Yoga, we don't play music. That's just a rule. And I always tell the beginner students, like, I'm a huge fan of the arts. I'm a huge music lover. But I use myself an example. If I listen to music while I'm practicing, because I love the sensation of music, it becomes, it enables me to not actually go deep into my own work at that moment. And so it's almost like finding that there's a time for me to fall into 
the movement of music and a time for me to actually do my practice, knowing how to separate the two to find that balance of what's happening mm-hmm. in that now moment. And I love that. You know, it's so funny. And I'll, I'll see if I can stand up. You guys can see. And, you know, we talk a lot about Kundalini and what, what Cindy's talking about. I don't know if you guys can see in my, but this, the area around this sacred, that's where that energy lies in that total bowl at the, at the base of the pelvis. And I'll never forget being at a, uh, a weekend intensive with David Grieg up in Philadelphia, my original Ashtanga teacher and him talking about how hard it is to access, especially for Western women to access that part of our, even our own bodies, which is our pleasure senses, because we've been taught, taught by society to like, not go there. You know what I'm saying? And so it's interesting. You brought that up because Aphrodite and Venus are inviting you to actually go there. And there's a lot of power in that area of the body. There's a lot of power in that. That's not just all sexual. It's, 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 it's another power that's there in that area of, of the body for both men and women, but for women, especially it's like women have a really hard time. And for us in yoga, we have the mola bunda connecting to it. Yeah, there's a whole other thing there that's happening but it's like it, it, we have been kind of the power of, of venus of aphrodite has been kind of stripped of us you know in, in the past on this timeline do you see moving forward into this age of aquarius that she will become more um more of a balanced uh character or energy in our lives this venus energy Oh, yeah, I can see it already happening with the rise of the even the divine, you know, we've had so many conversations about the divine feminine. Yeah. And that's part of it is awakening that sense that has been shamed for so long, because our pleasure centers have been um, definitely repressed or oppressed Mm -hmm. with things like you, you shouldn't feel that because it's, you know, it's sinful or there's shame around that. And, and we even hold ourselves that way. There's so many women that hold themselves, not just women, but men too, that hold ourselves where you feel like you have to like pucker it out, like hold it all in. You can't show that part of yourself. You know, right. like you got to hold it in, you got to cross your legs, you got to tighten everything up down there. Uh, because it, I'm, I'm talking about like millennium of shame tied to, to pleasure. Yeah, you know, all sorts of pleasure, and not just sexual pleasure, but just pleasure in general, like pleasure, we got to take it out of that box of being sinful. Right. Well, even taking about food, like I was because I'm not, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm someone that I'm not a foodie, you know, I'm not someone that like, I I, I can't cook for, I mean, I don't even know how to boil an egg. Let's be honest, I always have to call my mom to ask how do you boil a damn egg? Like, you know, just just never had had an interest in in having to, I'm sure if I had a child, I would learn because I would want to, but never had that interest. And when I eat food, it's more of just practical eating to, to move on to the next thing. But as re- I was thinking about how I, that's something that I need to work on in myself is to actually sit down when I eat and actually taste what's in my mouth if that makes sense and i and i know a lot of people though will go the extreme where they're using too much of food and then there's a a different reaction but i know a lot of people who are able to just sit and like really take in the sensation of eating and i'm just like let's do this let's get it over with and move on to the next thing Mm -hmm. um so and it's in the pleasure like for me i for like 20 years now i think i've I've probably 20 years now every night i take a salt bath every single night without fail. And that's something I really enjoy because there's a pleasure sensation in the smells of the salts and the bubbles. I mm-hmm. usually read, I usually read a murder mystery. Like, you know, I'm usually like, you know, there's pleasure in that and that's okay. It's, it's something you look forward to, you know, it's something that, that in, in, in this, in the, the uh, flipping on of the sensation, the senses is what gives you a sense of also almost who you kind of are in this body because different people have different likes and, and all that kind of stuff. Well, I mean, what, what else do you know about Venus? Do you know um, about the people on there or like, or, or, I mean, I'm just so fascinated. They only have, they don't have thumbs. Like, that, I don't know. Me away. I'm like, they don't have like, thumbs guys. They don't have thumbs. The, the actual <laughs> beings of Venus. I don't know too much about that. I wish I did though. I mean, yeah, I don't know what to see. I feel like it's like a ten year old boy. Way. I'm like, y'all, they don't have thumbs. Like I'm <laughs> so blown away by that that they don't have freaking thumbs. Um, but it's a beautiful planet, isn't it, Venus? She's beautiful. Uh, yeah. Well, well, because that's another thing that she represents. She is beauty. So one of the things that, that she holds, the energy that she holds, is pleasure, and the other one is a uh, beauty. And uh, anything that creates more beauty is is so Venusian. 
you know, talking about music, music that uplifts you, you know, talk about creating art, like art, music, any of that, that cultural experiences that we have that just really awaken us to life. Right. Um, beauty, that is all, um, you know, Ven Venusian qualities. And even seeing, and again, it's all just taking it back to, to yourself too. It's not just seeing the beauty that's out there, but then recognizing your own personal beauty and, you know, doing the things that make you feel beautiful as well. Like taking the time to, to do the things that, you know, whether it is brushing or putting on, brushing your hair, putting on lipstick, you know, you know or, or making your bed, you know, so, so that your room feels more, you know, all that stuff seems so like basic mm -hmm. or the things that don't matter, but it does matter. Mm -hmm. Whatever makes you feel good about yourself, whatever makes you feel beautiful, whatever creates more beauty in life, that is Venus. You know, we want, we want more of that. We want, we need more of that. We need more Venus in our lives. So just creating beauty, however you can through, through words, through songs, through lyrics, through dance, you know, any kind of movement, um, appre appreciating our own personal beauty, doing the things that make you feel, feel like that, that, that to feel it attractive. Cause Venus also through beauty, she has that essence of magnetism. Yeah. And, and, you know, when you're around someone, whether they're physically beautiful or whether they're poetic in their words, but there's just something about them that has like this magnetic pull, that oh, magnetism, absolutely. that absolutely. is Venus. Yeah. Oh, that absolutely. Is Venus. That's, um, there's, there's nothing sexier than someone that's doing what they love. You know, it's right. that energy associated with it. And it's, um, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder when you behold that energy that's what's so beautiful and that's what's so magnetic and and um so how if somebody's i know because i know a lot of our viewers right now are just now for so long even astrology was just doomed and gloomed by everyone that it was you know mm -hmm. sacrilege and i know so many people right now are starting to kind of rediscover this stuff that i believe our ancestors knew perfectly well about if someone watching this right now realizes that they are on a path they have patterns where they um deny themselves pleasure, what would be a good starting point to in, invoking Venus, the energies of Venus into, so, in, into someone's life if they're not used to that, allowing, giving themselves permission to have those experiences? I would start very basic, just the way that we were talking about. And that's the beauty of these planets, especially with Venus, because um, we live in a highly sensational world. There's no denying that. Yeah. Like you can walk out your, your door and you'll be something, something's going to, you'll either see someone walking or, you know, you'll see trees or you, you look up in the sky, you'll see the sun. Um, we, we live in a highly, highly sensational world. So to tie into Venus is actually quite easy. It's just a matter of awakening yourself. If you want to uh, tap into Venus, the more, the quickest way is to awaken yourself up to your senses and decide that you're going to not, uh, um, you're not going to be numb anymore. It could be as simple as every morning lighting an incense stick mm -hmm. and awakening your sense of smell. You know, it could be as simple as making sure that you turn on music that really brings you joy and that makes you come alive. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't have to be complicated. None of this. I mean, Venus is not complicated. It, it, because we are so immersed in a sensational world, it's really easy to look at the beauty and to see the beauty, if you want to, it's also really easy to look at everything that's going uh, wrong in the world, yep. but it's a just as easy to, to look at the beauty, to see the beauty. Yep. And so it's that shift of perspective of deciding that I'm going to, to see what's right and to see what's good in the world instead of focusing on all the shit that's wrong. All right. Venus is the one that says, no, you know, cause, cause like I said, it's just as easy to look at the good as it is to look at the bad. Absolutely. It, you just have to, you know, you have to turn, turn it around and, and decide that you want to do that. And there's, there's a lot of good around you. And there's so, so much, especially here in Georgia, I think we live in a beautiful state, mm -hmm. whatever state you live in, you know, the trees are magnificent. The birds are out there chirping, you know, the, there is so much beauty in the world. Yeah. It's like that Albert mm -hmm. Einstein quote. Uh, I think it was, was it Einstein that said, uh, you can live your life. The, I'm paraphrasing thinking everything isn't a miracle or everything is a miracle. Like it's how you perceive mm -hmm. it. 
And Georgia is, I have to tell you, know, I, I am a beach person. I like being on the coast as my mom's family is from, but lately I've been trying to dig into like the history of Atlantis and, and it's, it's proximity to the state of Georgia. And I've been, it's, it's kind of taken me back because Georgia is beautiful where we live is magical. Like it is gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Um, especially in North Georgia at the base of the Appalachian mountains, there's magic here around us in the nature. And I think everybody, I mean, I think about like even the uh, Southwest, which is another area that I've, I've been to, but I would like to explore more because there's magic there as well. It is all around you. And I guess, yes, that perception of, um, of that Venus energy of, of ex- being with it and experiencing that as well. Or you could live in Georgia and be like, these damn mosquitoes just won't stop biting. <laughs> Exactly. Because that happens too. Um, our yeah, we're like hot, 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 hot humans. Like, oh my, God. my friends who are not from Georgia, like that I film with, that in forever, they're like, in the summertime, I was like, man, I'm sweating like a whore in church. Like, it's just so hot here in, in Georgia. But, but you know, but there's beauty. I mean, people glisten. You know, we say as Southern women, we don't sweat, we glisten. You know, mm-hmm. like there's, there's beauty there too. Um, and so, and yeah, it's not, it's not all, I mean, we, we joke about the sex thing because it is, you know, that's kind of what we joke about, but it's more than just that. It, it's absolutely more than just that. So why don't we now yeah. talk about Jupiter, Jupiter, uh, Jupiter, he's the planet of just pure expansion and growth. We talked about the sun last time, how sun also represented your mission, mm-hmm. like your mission and your purpose in life, giving you clarity toward that. Well, what Jupiter does is Jupiter says, okay, this is how you can get there. These are the things that are going to attribute to your growth. These are the things that you can do that are going to align you with your mission and your purpose. Um, And, you know, Jupiter is like the the biggest planet out there. Mm -hmm. And he has like this very, you know, a lot of gravity uh, to him as well. And so... It suggests that the essence of growth and expansion and wealth, uh, those who are tied or are interested in, you know, just stepping into more abundance, they're in lack or scarcity. Uh, Jupiter is the, the first planet that you call on to, to try to help you out of that, that feeling of scarcity or that feeling of not having enough. Because uh, Jupiter wants you to feel like you have enough. Because that's where it starts. You know, it's, it starts there. If you're stuck in lack and scarcity all the time, it's even hard to tap into the sensation of growth. Right. And uh, so, uh, you know, he comes in to help you align your, your, your thoughts or, or any pre- pre- uh, preconditions that you might have. And woo, let me tell you, spiritual people have all sorts of crazy ass, uh, thoughts about wealth and money. Yeah, they do. I mean, we just do. I mean, there is so much. I mean, I, I, you know, I've had to do the personal work through that. I'm still doing the personal work, but almost, at, you know, just in general, that's something that people who are, are in the line of spirituality, they have a hard time with the idea of wealth. Yep. Because when they think of wealth, they think of greed automatically. You know what I mean? And so there's like this and in, in, especially if there are, are spiritual people who are trying to make a living, mm-hmm. God forbid, because then it's like there is just so much controversy around all that. Like, oh, well, you shouldn't make money over this. Anyways, all that to say is that um, spiritual, anyone who's like within the realm of, of, uh, of talking about spirit or, or expansion, which is they're all very Jupiter type topics because it's all about spreading wisdom and knowledge because Jupiter is also the planet of wisdom. Yeah. Okay. But he's also the planet of wealth. (laughs) You can spread wisdom and you can have wealth and they don't have to be one or the other. I know. And that's so funny you say that because uh, I've gotten that before as, um, as a teacher, I know you have too, Cindy, where people get mad that we charge tuition to come to our Mm -hmm. classes. And I'm like, I'm always like, well, I have to pay my teacher in India for my education. And if you want me to teach you, that's an energy I have to give. And if I'm not making money, then that means I, I have to get enough. I still have the same bills to pay that everybody else does. So I would have to go get a job 
and not be able to teach you anymore. And it is that weird. And, and I, I see it too with a lot of, I know a lot of people who are highly trained in a spiritual field who very much undervalue themselves with money. Now there are people out there that will charge way too much for what they're offering. Um, but yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up because whether it's uh, yoga, Reiki, whatever type of discipline that you're teaching you're allowed to make money doing it, especially if you mm -hmm. have put a lot of energy into your own education, you know, and yeah. I, yeah. The energy of Jupiter says pretty much confirms for you that it's okay for you to feel wealth. Right. And, and, and that can be in money or however that comes through to you. But in our society right now, wealth is very often the tide tied to money because the money gives you senses of freedom that right. if you don't have money or if you're living in exactly. poverty, if you're living, if you're living in poverty, it has a very restrictive feeling yeah. in your consciousness. I don't care what you say. It just it does. does. It, it, and, I, and people say all the time, to especially me, if it's poverty that you're not choosing for yourself. Right. It's, it's one thing yeah, you decide to go live off the grid yeah. and you're doing all that because you can live in wealth, living off the grid, living off the land. But if you are like in poverty and you're not choosing to be in poverty, that feeling sucks. Yeah. I mean, I know that feeling myself. Yeah. It's very constricting. And yeah. Jupiter is like, you know, you know, not, yeah, you don't, mm -hmm. that's not necessary for you to live in poverty to grow spiritually. No. It's so funny because people will say like to me, like, oh, well, you know, those gurus in India didn't charge that some of their students. Well, let me tell you what those students who didn't pay did for those gurus. They lived with them. They cleaned their house. They ran their errands for them. There was always an exchange happening to help the teacher out. And even like, yeah, like I look, I look at BKS Iyengard, uh, Patabi Joyce, even Krishmacharya towards the end, they were very wealthy towards the end of their, um, yeah. And that, that's, that's okay. Yeah. And I know that feeling of not having enough is, is mm -hmm. scary. It's a scary feeling. And that mm -hmm. of course will cause magnetism for more fear and more stress in your life. And that's not, you know, it's the opposite of Jupiter energy. Yeah. This is the opposite of expansion and growth. Right. And, and you don't need, I mean, I know the wall of one talks about this, like being a martyr is not a positive attribute. Mm -hmm. Don't, you know, so and I think a lot of spiritual people think that they need to put themselves in that position of being a martyr. It's not, a, that's not positive. It's not, that's mm -hmm. a service to self. Like that's not, you know, you, you don't need to be in that position. So, so yeah. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the wisdom of Jupiter. So what's the wisdom? If we have the wealth and the wisdom, is that father time? Well, we know Saturn is father time, but Saturn is father time. Jupiter is like, well, you're talking about the guru. You know, the guru, the way the weighty one, the one that has the wisdom, they're very Jupiterian, if that if that's a word, you know, so so the teachers, we'll one. We'll right. one. <laughs> <laughs> the, the teachers, the philosophers, the, you know, like the true gurus, um, uh, the ones who are, you know, heads of any kind of spiritual uh, community in a good way, you know, yeah. in a way that's providing We're wisdom about call leaders. We're talking about like. <laughs> Like in a good way, the ones yeah. that are providing true wisdom yeah. and yeah. A, a place where you can grow in that, like in your knowledge, in your wisdom, because it, 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 it takes you towards your mission. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's like um, the more knowledge we have, yeah. the, the, more, the, more we more, the more we open up to that knowledge and that wisdom, that's going to take us into the direction of, of our path. And so anyone who helps you with that, any teachers that help you with, with that, like the teachers, the philosophers, the, um, the priestesses or the priests, the, the, you know, the good kind, or the, the ones that really want to help you, that is also very, that's Jupiter. That's yeah. Jupiter energy. I keep thinking like Plato, Aristotle, like, you know, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Those teachings are still affecting us to this day. Uh, Jesus, Mary Magdalene. Um, mm -hmm. you know, the true teaching, not the, yeah, not the, not the, the corrupted teaching, but the true teaching was very self-liberating, um, within yourself, yes. you know? So absolutely. You know, it's so funny. Cause we were talking about you having, you know, your shawl is kind of like a mystery school and something I learned from one of saving a long time ago was that little blip on Jupiter that we see, you know, that dark, the eye of Jupiter, that dark circle actually 
allegedly connects to the pyramids of Giza, the energy cycle. And the fact that the mystery schools actually started in Egypt, connecting to Jupiter. So there's that Jupiter, Jupiterian energy right there, just on where people were growing and learning within themselves. Yes. Yeah. So wisdom uh, and, you know, we talk about growth, growth and expansion, wealth. I mean, these are all what Jupiter is about. And there's, there's nothing, you know, there's nothing wrong with, with any of that. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we need like, we need, I think we need more G Jupiter in our lives, just as much as we need Venus, mm -hmm. you know, Jupiter. And last time when we were talking about the sun, we talked about the placement of them within your astrological chart. Mm -hmm. And you can look at that as well, because I, I know I gave a little, or we were talking about, you know, giving a brief example of, of how your sun placement in your chart, like whatever your sun sign is. Well, your Venus also has a sign and mm -hmm. your Jupiter also has a sign and they also have house placements. So if you're in into astrology and, and you have a, a astrology chart and there's apps for that too. Um, the app that I use, I don't know if I uh, shared this before, but it's called Time Passages. Hold on, let me look and make sure that's right. And it's a great little app on your phone where you put in your, yeah, Time Passages. You put in your birth dates. I mean, there's, there's things online too, like Cafe Astrology and I think Astro.com, like if you're on a computer and you want to do it on a computer, but you can also uh, create your, find, uh, put it online and, oh, you can't see that. All you see is a white circle, but anyways, yeah. that was my, my chart. I want to look it up. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's so you funny. can, you can pull up your chart. It's, it's, it's pretty easy to get your chart. Oh but yeah. Time Passages is a, is a great app that I like to use. And there you can look at the placements. So which one is it? Is it the top one or the blue, the purple or blue? Uh, the one down, the one with the moon, half moon, the blue one. Okay. All right. I'm getting that right now, guys. I'm going to have this. It's so funny. I, uh, you know, I always laugh because um, I was born in South Carolina and my birth, I actually just, I was going through my old baby book, do some stuff today. And my, actually my original birth certificate isn't, is in my baby book, but I have apparently lost my birth, birth certificate many times because I've had to order it. And they, they, South Carolina from when I was born gives you the your exact time of birth. Like it gives you everything mm -hmm. on your birth certificate. I know some birth certificates don't, but it, it gives my exact time of birth. Um, and so, yeah, that's so cool. And it, it's so, yeah. wonderful. I've had my chart done three times in my life and it is, it is, it's, it's really fascinating because you can see all that stuff and where everything is, is connected. Um, well, I'll say I've had my chart done with my permission three times in my life, yeah. as I now oh know gosh. somebody else has been using my chart without my permission, but we've already talked uh, about that, but with my permission. But, so. Yeah. That you can look on your chart and see where, where your Jupiter, because again, your Jupiter has a sign like my Jupiter is in Capricorn. Mm -hmm. And it's in the 10th house. It's in the same house as my Sagittarius. So these are the things what, that are going to make, it's, it's going to give you some characteristics about, okay, what's going to make that the, the, your, your, your Jupiter self, you know, the part of you that wants to grow, that wants to expand, that wants to know wealth, you know, what house placement, what makes, what makes your Jupiter happy and what also stimulates it through, through the sign. And it can tell you about that. Look at, you know, look at your Jupiter, like my Venus is it in the Scorpio, which is probably not the best sign for Venus, but nonetheless, my Venus is in Scorpio and it's in the ninth house. I have a lot, a lot in the ninth house, but that's a way that you can also uh, take a look at, uh, look at the planets, look at how they're placed. And, and this is just very simple, basic astrology that I'm talking about here. I mean, you can go into all sorts of uh, deep, deep, deep dives within your astrological chart, but if you're not quite there yet, I mean, I don't know. I don't, there's a lot about that aspect of astrology. I don't know, but you can start very simply by looking, uh, understanding the attributes of the planet, looking at where they are within your chart and just start one, one at a time, you know, start with the sun. We talked about the sun. That's an easy one because most of us know our sun sign, mm -hmm. then move on to Jupiter. Okay. So where, you know, what's my Jupiter sign and what house is it in? Then move on to Venus and let that be a way to give you some awareness about your about yourself and what makes you tick and what makes, you know, brings out joy and what brings out expansion in your own life. It's, it's written out. It's literally written out in the stars on, 
on your chart. And yeah. that's, you know, so you, you, you can work with the, the planets through your chart. And the way we talked about last time is you, you call them down, you call down the energy by, you know, creating sacred space form, using candles doing doing little ceremonies with them on their day. Jupiter's day is Thursday. Venus's day is Friday. Mm -hmm. um, so those are what, what where, where today, Wednesday, we're actually on Mercury's, like, Mercury's what, day today. But what, so, what day is I, I don't even know anymore. I don't know. <laughs> but um, yeah, so if you need to call down more wealth in your life, you know, or, or more just wisdom or more growth, you, you, you want to know what growth feels like. You know, call it, it, it again. It's not that it's not there. The reason uh, or the way these these planets work is they they just show you parts of yourself that you've forgotten. Yeah. You know, you're always aligned with, or you you always have the possibility of being aligned with your growth, but you just may be veiled at the moment. Right. But what these uh, uh, planets will do though is they're going to make you also face parts of yourself. You actually have to show up. Yeah. With any of these, you you have to show up. And you, and you have to do the work that when they reveal something to you, then, you know, you go in and, and you do the work. Um, that's why doing work with like Jupiter and if you want more wealth, for instance, or more abundance in your life, then it's going to require you to, to do your, the work with where your mindset is around wealth and around money. I mean, yeah. are, are you yeah. shutting it off because you think that wealth is bad? Yeah, because there's this thing with money too, where, you know, there is a side to it that there's corruption. Yeah. And then there's no denying that, that, that happens, but it's also willing to like, to, to go there and to understand that and not shut yourself off from, from your own wealth, because you think that you're going to be corrupt or you're going to be feeding into this corrupt system. Do you see what I mean? So in other words, it's going to require you to go in into your mind and into your belief systems and to, to look at where you're holding yourself back from your own growth, expansion, wealth, wisdom, and, well, be um, and belief and systems that about yourself too. Cause as you're saying this, I know something that I had to work through in trauma therapy when I, and I, I am not really like, I've never, I mean, I always laugh. This is why I've always dated poor men because I'd, I've never really cared about like money's never really been a, I've never really thought about it, but I've also I realized in trauma therapy, it never felt like I deserved. Yeah. And that's, oh my God, that's a, big, a huge one. Huge one. Um, because, and I, and I grew up with a, in a pretty well to do family, but it was this like held belief I had about myself that I was undeserving of certain things. And that came from childhood stuff. But, um, but I didn't even realize that that was what was happening with me was, it was a mix of two things. Like I didn't really think about money that much, but I also didn't feel deserving of, 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 of getting back what I had put into certain things. Right. You know, like I had a job a long time ago where it was really hard for me to like get paid. Like I, I had to like chase down my paycheck. And I remember having to like talk to therapists about that because months would go by and I would be mm -hmm. like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't feel like I deserve to ask for that, you know? And, and that's, and I'm wondering, I know that's a, a childhood thing guys, but, but, um, but like, that's kind of, I guess if you, if you, I think a lot of people kind of have that issue. I don't think that's uncommon. And would that be oh, Jupiter, working with Jupiter too, to try to heal that? Yes. You can work with Jupiter to help heal all those different belief systems or traumas that we have around it. Or um, if you're, uh, another common one too, especially if you look more like me, you know, you're brown skinned or whatever is, well, people who look like me aren't, they don't, they're not the wealthy ones, mm -hmm. you know, people who look like me just don't, they don't get there. You know what I mean? Right. And so, uh, but that's the just another thing. belief system. Yeah, it's, it's a belief system that you put on yourself that isn't yes. actually, doesn't have to be true. It, no, it, it doesn't have to be true, but we can make it true. Like mm -hmm. we can believe it and we can sink our teeth in it and make it true. Mm -hmm. But it's, you know, it's not true. It's so funny because it seems like Jupiter doesn't want you to be a victim. Oh, no. Oh, my gosh. He will take you out of that victim or he'll try to take you out of that victim. Well, because victim mentality makes you small. Mm -hmm. Think of it. Anything that makes you small and constricted and Jupiter is going to blow that wide open because his main intention is for you to get in, in line with your mission and your purpose and to grow and to expand in that direction. 
And so anything that, 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 that constricts you, that will be his first place of healing for you. But again, that said, you got to go in and you got to do the work. So it's not like you work with Jupiter and Jupiter's like Santa Claus and right. you say, I'm going to light this candle. Hey, I want $20,000. <laughs> I'm just going to send it. Jupiter. And then Jupiter's like, here, here's your $20,000. You know, it doesn't work like that. But it, you, you can say something like, okay, I want to align myself up with, you know, receiving $20,000 a month or something. I don't know. You know, you can align yourself with that. And then Jupiter says, okay, you really want that? Okay, well, then now here's the, what you need to, to do. Here's the belief systems that you have that, yeah, anything that has to do with you don't deserve it or yep. um, you can't do it. It's impossible because there's a lot of that just sense of impossibility. Yeah, it just doesn't seem possible. And let's you know what I mean? There's a lot of that. Yeah. And all of this. Yeah, it is. I'm so glad you brought that up because it isn't like a vending machine. It isn't like Santa Claus. It isn't like spell casting. Like now give it to me. It's actually going to make you work for it. Mm -hmm. It's good. And that's going to it because you have it within your power and within your capacity to align with the things that that you want to call forth, you know, mm -hmm. um, but that you have to do that. Someone like the, these external forces aren't going to just suddenly make you that way, no. but they will show you where, um, you know, what you need to do. They'll show you the path, what, what you need to take to, uh, to align with it. And you can make it as big or as small as you want. You know, you can, I mean, it truly is all about you, how, how much you're willing to believe. And there's another thing about Jupiter. And this was one of uh, Jupiter's lessons for me. I think it was, a little, it's a little bit of a mix of Jupiter and Venus um, where growth, you know, the idea of, of growth, there's a lot of sensation that comes with that. I'm sure you probably experienced that you yourself, Bryce, with your channel, like you grow but then the, there's a lot of beautiful things, you know, probably a lot of feedback that you receive. Mm -hmm. Suddenly people are content, you get good feedback and then you might not, you might get other kinds of feedback mm -hmm. because you've exposed yourself. Yeah. Right. And so then you're suddenly open to all of this, you know, all, more energy coming towards you. Yeah, absolutely. And that's part of growth, right? Because when you're, when you're growing in this, in, in your capacity, yeah, you, be, you become more visible to the world. Mm -hmm. And, and when that visibility happens, there could come a sense of overwhelm. Mm, like, oh my God, God, you know what I mean? Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that overwhelm is part of growth, but that overwhelm can also shut you down. Like you're like, oh my God, this is just too much emotion. This is too much, so I'm going to shut it down. So it's almost like a little bit of, of like Jupiter with Venus, being able to hold more sensation so that you can grow and, and, and then you can just, you hold more. Mm -hmm. And that's Jupiter too. And, and that expansive sense of growth, you just simply, you're able to hold more than you think you can. And that is like, it's like your container has to expand and grow. And that also takes practice. Like yeah, it doesn't yeah. just expand and grow probably all at once. It, it probably has to go like this. So you don't like totally shut yourself down and overwhelm. You know, it's so funny too, because I have, um, a little bit of an issue with like OCD with some stuff. And I know that comes from like anxiety disorders that I have with, uh, PTSD, but it's like weird OCD. Like before I was on YouTube, I would freak out if there was an email in my inbox that I hadn't checked or read or responded to, or if there was a text I hadn't read or responded to, but because of what's happening with YouTube, I'm, I'm constantly getting emails. I'm constantly getting, I mean, you know, Cindy, I mean, Cindy, you're my friend in real life. And sometimes it takes me a couple of days to respond to your text messages, you know? And before this, it's been a practice for me because before this, I would have freaked out. But there are days when I, I just have to let things go. Like I have to let some emails go because there's not, you know, and so it, I understand what you're saying, like that overwhelming panicking, but then if you write it, you can start to kind of even break through your own barriers. Yeah, yeah, that's Jupiter. That's yeah. Jupiter right there. It's like, I think it's a little bit of Jupiter and Venus. It's like you have to train yourself to hold more sensation, mm -hmm. to hold more and more, but that expands you and it grows you. So you can hold more clear to your vision and purpose without getting so distracted or without self-sabotaging yourself and saying, oh, I can't take this. Like yeah. this is too much. This is too hard. And so the whole self-sabotage comes in. 
Yeah, yeah. it does uh, too. And I think it's because we do, yeah, that self-sabotage. And also we, we put unrealistic expectations when we, it, yeah, because mm-hmm. you're, when you expand and grow, everything does change. And so you have to change too. You know, what worked for you, for me with the, that was a good example, having a platform now, I'm still the same person before I had the platform, but aspects of myself have had to change in order to fit into this new reality that is my life. You know, mm-hmm. that makes sense. And so it's, it's not self-sabotage. It's just moving the self to fit, to fit with the new path of life. But I'm still the same person. I'm just not as OCD by my emails anymore because I can't be, <laughs> can't be, it's impossible. So, so yeah, that's so, I'm, this is so fascinating. I love all of this information. I'm so happy it's coming back into, um, you, now I want to say with Venus too, I forgot to say this. Uh, it is the morning star. Now it has flipped. It used to be that we could mm-hmm. see Venus at night, but now we're seeing it in the morning and it, and it, it came uh, in January. And for those that aren't aware, that's actually the book of revelation. That's when we know we're changing timelines is because uh, into the age of Aquarius from the, for those who would know that watch this channel, you know, revelations is not a scary book. It's actually a very exciting book. It's about the changing of a timeline. And the, the morning star is Venus that in January, now Venus is seen in the morning and not the evening is Jupiter. You can see as well too, right in the sky sometimes. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. There are times when Jupiter is big and strong and, and uh, as a matter of fact, that there was that recent conjunct, what was it? Shit, I can't remember. It was Jupiter and another, it was it Jupiter and Saturn. Was it last um, uh, winter solstice? Yeah, it, well, it was right. It was before, or, and it wasn't here this last winter solstice. It, it was before, before that. Yeah, that's but what I see. It was with the conduit where they, they were saying it was, uh, um, it was what they saw in the sky during the, the Christ. Yeah, but it was, we were entering in the, it was like we were exiting one time. It was like the star of Bethlehem, but exiting from one yes. time to another one. It, it was exactly, we, I, we, that was, yeah, over a year ago, because that was, uh, what was mm-hmm. that, 2020, uh, winter solstice. And living, I mean, Cindy lives in, in an area that's suburb, but I live, like, right in the middle of the city, so all I see is skyscrapers. And we drove everywhere trying to see if we could see the constellation, and it okay. was just, we mm-hmm. could not, it was, it was too smoggy or cloudy. and We could see it. We could step outside the studio. Actually, that's what we did. I taught a yoga class that day. And then afterward, we went outside to see it, but it never fully conjuncted. You could still see the two planets separate from each other. It never went into full, like a full, but it was still really, really cool to see. Yeah. To see an experience. So, yeah, I mean. I mean, I think planets are portals as well. I think Earth's also a portal. I think there's so much more to the energies of planets than we've been led to believe. And um, even in uh, the apocrypha, or excuse me, the apocalypse of Abraham, I was just so fascinated in that missing book where God told Abraham, like, the stars and the planets, they live in the fifth firmament and they are messengers, which we know messenger yeah. means angel. So they are as powerful as the angels, what we would consider. And we know that angels are associated with the planets as well. Like, you know, Michael is the sun, Gabriel's the moon, you know? So it's, it's so fascinating how powerful, um, these, these, these things are. And that for a short, I think it's actually been a very short period of time in our timeline. We haven't been privy to that knowledge. I think for most of our humanity, our ancestors knew exactly what was going on in the skies. And then we just for a very short period lost that connection, but we're getting it back again. And that's, it, it, it forces people to be accountable to themselves too. You can't, you know, kind of takes again, that victim mentality away where you now have to do the work yourself. So. Yeah. And another interesting thing about Venus, you're talking about, uh, uh, is, is that her path is, if you follow her path, it's actually, it forms a pentacle. Interesting. You can, you can like look that shit up too. Yes. That's interesting. <laughs> that when we know and that the principle is the only, it's just spirit, air, you know, earth, yeah. water. I was about to say, that's another thing. Four that's elements. Thing. That's mm-hmm. another thing that's been inverted in, in our world is for us to run away from those things. And, and, and um, that's actually not, like, it, and I've said this before so many times, like the dark cult, the dark bunch darkness can't create only light can create. So everything that's in existence was first created by the light and used for positive and then was corrupted by the darkness. And actually, Cindy, I'm going to ask you this on this show. I was going to text you, but I'm going to put you on the spot because you know, um, you were the one that recommended um, this book to me. Mm -hmm. We're now reading it through, we're doing a series on Magdalene. 
I want to do after we go through this, I've been telling everybody that I, my plans are to go to the priestesshood of Isis. And I want to bring you on for that too, because that's something you have knowledge about. And that's another thing that's been inverted in our world is this idea of Isis and what Isis really was. And so, mm -hmm. so I hope, we'll well, so, you know, this is all like all the God Venus, Aphrodite, the goddess, how the goddess yeah. has been yeah. diminished. Mary Magdalene, how she's been diminished. Yeah. Where she was a, a priestess of Isis and Hathor. Right. So, yes, yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh -huh. And I have the book of the Sophia code. I love that. And there's oh, another. Okay. Got it right here. I just haven't started it yet. So yes, that's a bit. I love that one. Um, there's a great information in that. And there's another book. Um, I have the second it's a, it's a channeled book and it, it talks about uh, Mary's uh, the, the grandmother. Anna. Yes. The, the mother Mary's. Yeah. yeah. The book's on yeah. Anna. Okay, I have the second book on Anna, but the first one, I haven't read the first one. It comes highly recommended as well, but it talks a lot about that. Is even the, even the second book talks about it, but the first book, again, it's a channel book, but I love it. I think it's great. It talks about the, the mysteries and the, the, how it's tied into the, the priestesses of Isis and all that. Yeah. And so, I mean, that's what Jesus, Joshua grew up around was these women that mm -hmm. had, yeah. So there's a lot. And that's what's so fun for me because there's so much, there's so much liberation now because all these things that we've been taught are bad are not actually bad. And so there's, there, there's liberation and, and rediscovering these tools and this knowledge that our ancestors had. And that's super exciting. That's super exciting. Yes. And the goddess, and, and this is a very a Venus and Aphrodite and just a general sense of the goddess teachings. It's so much about embodiment. Yeah. Instead of trying to transcend like your body is this bad thing, it's yeah. so much about embodying and loving your body and not hating on it or thinking that your body is a bad thing, which is a, you know, which is a thing that you hear in uh, an older, like old spirituality, like the body is something that's terrible. Uh, you know, it's, it just gets in the way of your ascension or your enlightenment, yeah. but the goddess teachings and goddess teachings are tantra. Those yeah. are tantric teachings. Um, it's more about you go through your body to know, to know your enlightenment. And that is so Venus. And so after it's like, it's what we're talking about, the sensations, like live through your body, see the beauty, smell, live life. And that's going to awaken you up to just life itself. When, when life itself, that's all it wants. It just wants you to experience it. You know, that that's a big um, something that Alan Watts said, that you live for life for life itself. It's yep. just simply to be alive. I love and Alan that. Is so, yeah. That is so, that is such a Venusian or Aphrodite yeah. thing, because you got to awaken yourself to, you got to be willing to take it in. And that is like embodiment, you know, and that's so such a goddess thing too. It's not, you don't transcend your body. You come in, you love your body. And that's what uh, the Venus teachings teachings are too. love yourself, love your body, love your form. Your form isn't bad. And then extend that love because, you know, Venus is all about the love, all about yeah. the love. Extend that love out wherever you can. I love how Alan Watts, because when I read that, when he was, because it's like human beings, we have this like propensity to try to make things way more difficult than they really are. And when I remember reading that with his writing, like, you know, we try, what's the point of life? And we have all these like deep, you know, theories. And he's like, just be alive. <laughs> That's the point of life. Exactly. Just be alive. Just be human. Like, you know, so I love Alan Watts. Love. If you guys have not read any of Alan Watts' um, writings, they can be intense. I mean, they can be, they can be, but uh, I can put some links down to some of his books down in the description box below. He's no longer with us. I'm kind of bummed that he's no longer with us because... I think him and Ram Dass, they would have been quite tickled to see this unfolding. I think they were friends for a little while, Alan Watts and Ram, and Ram Dass. I'm sure that would have been a fun room to be in. Yeah, we were in a room together. Do you know I? But it's there's a lot of stuff on YouTube with uh, Alan with Watts. Them. stuff. Like if you, if you want to go YouTubing down the there's, Alan Watts rabbit hole. There, it's so funny that uh, so I I'm not a huge this kind of off subject, and people watching might not know what Kirtan is, but Kirtan is like. 
rock music for spiritual people. We'll put it that way. I'm not a huge Kirtan person, to be honest with you guys. I'd rather, I'd rather listen to some Aerosmith. Like, I'm just not. But I did go to a Bhagavan Das uh, Kirtan once before. And there's, and Bhagavan Das obviously was uh, used to kind of pal around with Ram Das and they had a falling out because Bhagavan Das has his own issues. And regardless of all the issues Bhagavan Das had, there was definitely something about that man. Like there was some very magnetism about like there was something very powerful about and and I'm not a Kirtan person, but um mm-hmm. but he was it was it was really intense. And so yeah, that whole group, the Alan Watts, the Ram Das, the Bhagavan Das, who's the one that looks like Ned Flanders that's Kirtan as well that was around with them? Krish- Krishna Das, is that Yes. Yeah, he kind of looks like Ned Flanders and he's still out there doing yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. They're all kind of together. Yeah. So, yeah. um, it's so. Like Krishnadas. Yeah. 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 I'm glad, I'm glad you're not, I always feel like when I tell people in the spiritual world that I'm not really a Kirtan person, they're like, oh. and I'm like, I just don't. No, I'm not either. Really. I mean, I've, yeah, I've had Kirtans here at the studio and they're lovely, but yeah, I don't listen to Kirtans on my radio. No. Yeah. I totally listen to like, I don't know, something in the eighties, the seventies, the eighties rock and roll i'm yeah. totally the glamour. i'm totally like the glamour rock girl that's yeah. oh me too <laughs> well, yeah 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 <laughs> i used to live in la i used to live on the sunset strip i was actually a house guest at the viper room and that glam rock is still really big in la like for a while there the only men i dated wore eyeliner like that was like you know i shared like, with an ex-boyfriend like we shared jeans because it was the tight you know eyeliner jeans it would take him longer to get ready than me so it's still it was still very much alive in the early 2000s in LA and I would go to the yeah so that's me too I like that um rock and I'll tell you something too my son he's 16 years old and he's a classical musician he plays classical he plays a classical piano he's been playing since he was three years old he loves classical music I mean he actually that's what he listens to he loves I mean, so he listens to Beethoven and he listens to um, Chopin and Rachmaninoff and he plays them. And our house is full of, you know, classical music going on the time. And I'm like, um, can we not listen to classical music? Can I like, listen to like some Bon Jovi? Can we listen to Prince? Like, I love my that. son, yeah, to Prince or something like that. My and son's like, like, it's the roles are reversed. Hey, I said on the other day. I went to a Bon Jovi concert when I lived in Los Angeles at the Staples Center, and that was one of the most fun concerts I've ever been through. Yeah. First of all, Bon Jovi is tiny. He's like, I don't even know, he's five feet tall. Like, he's tiny. And the hair, oh my God, the hair was amazing from all the women, mm-hmm. the big jersey hair. And um, yeah, the Rolling Stones were great. Mick Jagger just ran over the stage the whole time. And um, let's see, I've been to Journey, Ario Speedwagon, Ted Nugent. Like, I, Stick. Oh, yeah. I, went, I went to Sticks. I had so much fun at Sticks. I was kind of, yeah. I was parents, I was kind of embarrassed to go to Sticks, but I had so much fun at the Sticks. It was, they were so great. Um, I've been to the, the monkeys before the lead singer passed away. I saw with, I, my parents at Chastain Park to the monkeys. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, I love rock and roll though. It's, it's so, I miss going to concerts because there's an, energy. yeah, I know. So do I. I, I love it too, but yeah, it's just, it's just kind of funny how <laughs> to each their own. Right. But yeah, my son is like, he's, let's say he says he's not into like music of his time. And he'll listen to music of our time, but he doesn't listen to the music of this time. Like he prefers listening to like, you know, I mean, seriously, he will listen to Beethoven and he will listen to Chopin. I'm like, who are you? <laughs> he's like, his last <laughs> life was Vienna, Austria. Me and my husband are not that, like, we're not that way. <laughs> That is awesome. But, that is awesome. You know, and that, that's, that's all Venus too. You know, yeah. it's awful. Yeah. It's well, he's Venus. very talented, you guys. Like she, I can't believe he's 16. I feel like, God, kids get older, we get older. I feel like he's still a little kid. But um, you play, you post his videos all the time of him playing. And he's so talented. He's so talented. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's definitely, yeah, he's pretty good. Be doing. He's he's definitely, he's all right. can't, take, yeah. can't take that away from him. That's for sure. I mean, he yeah. works his tail off. To he's so talented. Yeah. He's going to make something of himself with that talent because he definitely, it's not just, you know, a lot of kids take the piano, a lot of kids do, but he literally has got a talent. It's in his blood. It's in his, his obvious, obviously, if he's listening to it 
not being forced to too because a lot of kids are forced to listen to mozart so um yeah, he's got a love he's got a love for it yeah but that is um you know speaking of like the goddess Sar saraswati mm -hmm. you know she's the goddess well. of of culture and of beauty and of music and all that i mean saraswati would fall under probably the umbrella of like venus and and aphrodite mm -hmm. just well you know whatever makes your heart sing whatever makes you come alive you know, whatever makes you get up in the morning and say, yes, you know, this, yeah. this life is worth living. I mean, that is, that's what it's all about. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, that. and in this world where we take everything so seriously, you know, I think we just have to, to not, just to not, not take it, yeah, just to not, to just, oh, just, because that's another thing, you know, with spirit in, in the spirit realm, we tend to like take things way way too seriously oh yeah and like is the i mean where, where the beauty lies is in those moments of grace when you've let up yes giving well, yourself a, a moment of breath or a moment of laughter well that's when the true grace comes in right and beauty yes yeah, Gu well guruji patabi joyce apparently back in the day before he was swamped with students if he had a student that took it way too seriously He'd be like, oh, no room when there was plenty of room. Like he would turn them away and they learn to have a freaking sense of humor, you know, learn to laugh. And that's, and I always, I joke with my students, there's, um, used to be a VHS, but this teacher, Richard Freeman, who's one of the first to kind of bring traditional yoga to, yoga to the West. And he has this like nineties video of him doing primary series. I mean, it's totally nineties, the outfit, the, the, the backdrop. And he says, you know, in order to do Ashtanga yoga, there are two things you need a sense of humor and the ability to laugh at yourself. But it's really oh, yeah. true. Like it is true. And I think that's, that's, that's true for everything. We do take ourselves way too seriously and, um, and serious that, that seriousness isn't pleasure. And that's that, what I'm talking about. It, it isn't pleasure. It so. really isn't. So yeah, lighten up. Doesn't mean that you don't, uh, you just, you fall off your path, but just lighten up a little. Yeah. It'll be all right. Yourself. It's okay. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> so, all right, Cindy, this has been so, so fun. Next week. Do you want to do more planets next week? Yeah. I'll let you. Um, okay. I'll think about it and see, maybe we'll get into the moon. So I'm sure. Cause the moon is, is big. Obviously yeah. we, there's all sorts of controversy around the moon too. Yeah, we can talk about that too, but <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> women, we're moon. So we get our monthly cycle. So yeah, we absolutely. So we'll do the moon and another planet next week. I'll let you pick. So this has been so fun, Cindy. So once again, guys, I'm going to put all of her links down in the description box below. Please make sure to go. If you like these talks and you want to know more, please make sure you subscribe to her channel because she has a lot more stuff on her channel, including practices. If you're still looking to kind of dabble into the asana, the posture practice of yoga. And of course, I'm going to be putting up links to her website. If you're interested in, any, in going deeper into any of these topics and any of her intensives and her courses. All right, guys, I hope you guys are having a wonderful week week and we actually you know what's funny is this is going to be dropped on thursday on jupiter's, jupiter's day. day so i hope you guys are having a wonderful jupiter's day <laughs> and a yes. happy Venus day on friday which is actually my birthday so so enjoy enjoy your friday so enjoy that the enjoy day that. of the goddess I take know. it in have fun day of the goddess, day of the uh -huh. goddess. <laughs> all right guys we'll talk to you soon bye everybody